Good day, Thomas Jefferson, our podcast listeners. I I can't thank you enough for listening to this podcast. We so appreciate it. There's a number of different ways to support the show. And if you are not of a mind to do that or unable to do that, write us a letter. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you don't like. Ask President Jefferson a question. Ask Clay Jenkinson a question. And that's great. And we appreciate it. So this week, and it's not a lie. I'm not making it up. I caught a post about when are they going to do another gardening show? And I thought, that's all I need. And asked Mr. Jefferson if he would be willing to talk about gardens. And after all the politics we've talked to him about recently, he was very receptive to the idea. Well, I love the gardening shows. I think we've done about 10 over time. We talk about it for a few minutes from time to time, but seldom do we talk about it for the entire hour. And I appreciate our listeners who love that part of it. Not everyone does. I mean, I'm a gardener for two reasons. My grandparents were gardeners in Minnesota, and my grandmother Rhoda had a garden of about I'd say half an acre, and was out on her hands and knees uh, well into her 80s, uh, and then would can three to 500 quarts per annum. Um, and many of those, uh, those jars were in her cellar at the time of her death. And for me, whenever I do this, I have rhubarb from their garden, and whenever I can pickles or can anything, tomato juice, I think of her, and I feel that I am more connected to something real than when I'm in my study Jefferson came into my life about 30 years ago. He came into your life about 15 years ago. And we both have to say he's transformed us, that not only looking at Jefferson and gardening, but getting to know the great Pat Brodowski, the former head gardener at Monticello, has really changed the way I see all of this, and you more than I, because you actually keep those records that Jefferson recommended. I do, and I thanked him for it, and I meant it. There, There is just something about gardening, you know, without getting too over the top. It's like if you have a hole in your life and you just can't fill it, gardening might do it for you. It might be temporary, but even that temporary is pretty good. I meet a lot of people who say, well, I'd love to do that, but I live in a townhouse or whatever. And the thing to do is to go to your hardware store and get a five-gallon bucket, just a plastic five-gallon bucket. If you want to get a planter, that's fine. But a bucket will do and fill it with soil and potting soil and then grow a couple of things. And you can move it around to give it the right amount of light and shade. You don't have to go into this in a big way. You can grow a couple of things. And maybe you grow a tomato plant, and at the end of the year you get 15 tomatoes. You'll be thrilled, and you'll be hooked. Uh, it's a, it's an amazing thing. And as I often say, David, and it's, I don't know if it'll happen this year because of this very severe drought on the Great Plains, but my happiest day of the year is in August when I go out and pluck a cob of corn and an onion and a couple of tomatoes and a cucumber and come in and eat them within 10 minutes. And at that time, I feel empowered in a way that I can't explain um, in any other instance in my life. Agreed. Amazing that the soil does this for us. And and, and Jefferson, who said cutting down a tree was tantamount to murder. (laughs) Yes, he thought that that cutting a tree unnecessarily was a form of, uh, I suppose you'd call it herbicide. And he meant this. He said this to, to poor Margaret Bayard Smith, who already realized that he was a bit of a loon. Um, But he gave her a geranium plant when he left Washington, D.C., which she treasured. And uh, she comments about his mockingbird that used to hop around the White House after him and all the plants that he grew in the window wells of the White House and so on. Uh, Jefferson was an eccentric, and he loved to grow things. And when I come across a book of Jefferson quotations, I always look to see if they get one of my favorite, in which he said to his daughter Martha, no sprig of grass grows uninteresting to me. Let's get on to the show. Uh, Anything you'd like to update listeners on? Again, a high praise to Kevin Miterman, our friend from Thompson, North Dakota, who produced that fabulous Heritage guitar, which we sold at auction to a man in San Diego. Uh, What a a tremendous piece of artistry and what a great gift uh, for the future of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We so appreciate it. The books that uh, my friend uh, Michael from uh, Norfolk put into the hands of Congress are there. I've begun to get notes from Uh, senators and congressmen. He provided the funds so that all 535 members of Congress would get a a free copy of my book, Repairing Jefferson's America. My new book, The Language of Cottonwood's Essays on the Future of North Dakota, is now out. It it ends uh, with a chapter on the life of a cottonwood tree from the moment that its seed um, um, germinates in the ground to 150 or so years later when it crumbles back into the earth. 
Then there are all the cultural tours. We've, we've finished our classes until August. There's an online class on Virgil's Aeneid, the greatest epic in the Roman, in the Latin language. That's in August and then in the fall, another constitution course. But the two retreats, as always, at Loxaw Lodge in January. You can find out more about them at jeffersonhour.com. And then um, after a hiatus because of the pandemic, our cultural tour to John Steinbeck's Monterey with my friend Russ Eagle, the man who grew the pea, uh, that will be in the spring of 2022. So lots and lots and lots going on. And to close, I just want to say I've been reading these books on the Great Plains. So O.E. Rolvog's Giants in the Earth, um, Willa Cather's My Antonia, Dust Bowl Diary by Anne Marie Lowe, uh, and a, a book by a North Dakota novelist, Lois Phillips Hudson, called Bones of Plenty. I'll post all of these on our site. But these books have given me such gratitude to have a hose, David, to have a sprinkler system, to have the capacity to keep plants alive during a drought. Imagine if you had, your garden is right next to your house, but imagine if you had to hand water using, a, using a, say, a mason jar, everything that you're growing there. Thanks to everyone. I hope you like this program. Next week, we'll be back to more typical Jefferson Hour topics. And thanks so much for listening. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. Mr. Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author and creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. I'm your host, David Swenson, and it's so good to speak with you, Mr. Jefferson. I've been looking forward to this pleasant conversation in my mind for a couple of weeks now. Well, thank you, sir. I... Uh... I'm always eager to talk about America and to try to vindicate America and the American ideals in the eyes of the world. Sir, a recent post by a, a listener to the Jefferson Hour wondered if we would ever or, or when we would have another conversation about gardening. And of course, you know me well enough to know it didn't take much prompting to bring that up as a subject for discussion. Well, you know that if I could have chosen my my profession, if I had been completely free uh, and emergencies like the American Revolution and our independence movement and the, the struggle for the meaning of the revolution that I undertook with Colonel Hamilton and his brethren, if those things hadn't happened, I would have said that the ideal life for me would have been to find a, a particularly fertile spot somewhere in the western part of Virginia and to grow vegetables for pleasure but also to grow them for others, to be a sort of an experimental gardener, uh, to subsist on my own produce and to be able to um, offer it either uh, as a gift or for sale to others who had a similar interest. Uh, that would have uh, suited me, I think, much better than the disagreeable burden of political life. Well, sir, you, we often talk about your vegetable garden. But you really had a hand in much more than just growing your own garden to eat. You had orchards, you had fields, uh, you had flowers. So you had to be sort of a jack of all trades when it came to growing. As I said to my daughter Martha once, no sprig of grass grows uninteresting to me. When you think about vegetables, plants, the things that grow in a garden, from the root crops like carrots and, and beets and onions to those which flourish above the surface like corn or beans or peas, uh, you're, you're just filled with a sense of wonder. And if you were a religious person, you would be filled with a sense of God's majesty in creation. But even a deist like myself sees the infinite variety that life takes and the colors of different plants and the, the, the textures when you eat them. Um, even if you're a secularist like myself, you can't help but look upon this, the fecundity of the world, the variety of the things that grow, the variety of life forms, their perfection within their own kind. I mean, what would life be without the garden pea? Uh, or more to the point, what would life be without wheat and oats and rice? That the Creator designed uh, the best of all possible worlds, and we live in it. And fortunately, we're clever. We actually can can train creation. And instead of having 
a wild strawberry here and a wild raspberry there, we can grow a raspberry patch. And we can have, instead of a, the odd ear of corn, uh, the, the small variety that was originally found in South America, we can have row upon row of, of majestic corn producing this mighty product for us. And so it, it thrills me. It, 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 makes, it connects me to nature. It makes me believe in the goodness of life to be out puttering in the garden. And I, I was fortunate. I had lots of land. And of course, I had lots of help. But I had orchards. Um, I had vineyards, although they never flourished. Uh, I had um, uh, what might be called an industrial garden, a garden to feed myself and, and the people who lived on the mountain. And then I had a personal garden just for joy. And then also on top of all that, an experimental garden, which where I grew rare crops, seeds brought by Lewis and Clark from the American West, seeds sent to me from Italy, seeds sent to me from the Low Countries, seeds sent to me by the by the gardeners and the and the greenhouse owners all over the United States, the, the exchange of seeds, uh, so that we can see what grows in what soil under what conditions. Uh, this is one of the 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 principal pleasures of life. So yes, but though an old man, I always called myself a young and very enthusiastic gardener. Well, there are a couple of things you spoke about that uh, I would like to respond to. Uh, one is a personal item, and you talked about the joy of growing your own food and the odors and the taste. And I will never forget uh, one year having a young person come to my very small garden, which I must say, sir, you have inspired me to plan better every year and take better care of every year. But this young person who was a, a real vegetable eater came out back to my small garden, and I bent down over a uh, row of fresh spinach and picked a couple of leaves off the spinach and handed it to this young person who ate it and said, oh my, that's what it's supposed to taste like. Of course, as a gardener, you, you know the pleasure I got from that comment. There was only one pleasure that he could have had that would have been greater than that, and that would have been had he grown it himself. He, he was ingesting something that had beautiful organic virtue and taste because he was that close to the fertility of the soil. But imagine if he had put a tiny little seed in the ground and this lettuce had sprung up and he had harvested himself and ingested it. He would not only have all the pleasures that he had in that moment, but he would have the additional pleasure of, of having done this, having, having participated in his subsistence in a meaningful way. It, another thing you spoke about was your seeds and how you acquired them. You know, in my time, sir, I, I every every early spring or even in the winter, I receive catalogs in the mail where I can see photographs of beautiful pictures of the different varieties that I can grow. And it's as simple as me paying this merchant a certain amount of money and the seeds show up at my door. Not so during your time. I have had the pleasure, although years ago, to be at Monticello, and I noticed in one area your collection of seeds that they've preserved so that people can see them and how meticulous you were in your organization. I was very impressed. Well, well, sir, organization is everything. The well-ordered life is uh, dramatically, maybe exponentially, more efficient than a disordered life. And I had a rage for order. Uh, I kept weather data. I kept elaborate garden and farm books of when things bloomed this year or that, how many inches of rainfall we had had, the hottest day and the coldest day, the sorts of clouds that we have. My books were uh, extremely well organized under the Baconian system, the tripart system of reason, memory, and imagination. Um, it's the fact that if you came to Monticello at any time between 1775, say, and 1824 and asked, Mr. Jefferson, where is X? Where is that theodolite? Where are those seeds that were sent to you from up on the Lewis and Clark expedition? Where is that letter from John Adams complaining that you had misquoted him at some point earlier in your life? I could find anything at any time with instant assurance that I knew where things were. I was that well organized. And if you're going to be a gardener, 
in my time, there were seed catalogs. You could you could order some of these things, but it was cumbersome. I kept my own seeds. That's the glory of agriculture. The glory of agriculture is that you put a pea in a piece of ground and up springs a pea plant, and that pea plant might have one, two, or ten pods. And if everything goes right, you harvest those pods, and now you have not the original seed, now you have 50 peas. And you may eat five of them just to, you know, to survey their taste or just for pure pleasure, but you don't want to eat many of them at this point. But now let's say instead of one this year, I now have 50 and I plant them next year and 46 of them grow and four don't, but the 46 each produce 10 pea pods themselves. And suddenly now I have bushels of peas. And if I keep at it, I will soon have a warehouse of peas. I mean, this is essentially an experiment that you see uh, occur in Robinson Crusoe, that great novel by Daniel Defoe, in which he finds a little bag, a little cloth bag, and dumps it out carelessly and later discovers that it, it had some oat seeds in it, some grain. And this revolutionizes his life on this barren island. So this is the same experiment, but that's the miracle of the seed. One seed produces 10. Those 10 produce 100 or 1,000 or 5,000. And, and this is where wealth comes from. The, the, the French had uh, an economic school called physiocrats or physiocracy. And in, in physiocracy, the theory was, and I believe that it is truth, that all wealth comes from the soil. That it's that. It's the putting in a, a kernel of wheat and getting 100. That's wealth production. It's when humans work in and cooperate with nature and nature's law that wealth production really occurs. And if you compare that to a, a Hamiltonian banker who's never done any real work in his life and speculates in stocks and in bonds and in paper certificates and makes money from no human productivity but merely by speculation and the exploitation of others, you see the difference. There's a moral beauty and a moral virtue in husbandry that does not exist in banking, and frankly, it does not exist in lawyering or any number of other trades. Those trades may be important, but they don't produce wealth in the way that the earth does. And so this is the center of, 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 a, of a, a virtuous and, and healthy economy, agriculture, the agrarian, and it's the kind of society and civilization that I wish to see flourish in the United States. And 90 some percent of us were farmers, but I wanted more and more of us to fall in love with the idea of the seed and the fertility that the earth provides for us. And that would create a special type of American virtue that hadn't been seen on earth uh, since the time of the Roman poet Horace or the Roman poet Virgil. And so for me, this is not just a question of the delight in a plate of peas, although I very much did delight, especially in the first plate of peas in the spring. There was a contest that we held in Albemarle County, but my delight goes much deeper than that. It's about independence. It's about being a, a sovereign human being. It's about providing some of your own subsistence, and if possible, all of it, because that's truly what makes you independent. Very good, Mr. Jefferson. We need to take a short break, but let's return to this conversation, shall we? Of course, I, I know of no subject that, that, that pleases me more than talking about land and gardening. Very good, sir. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. And I'm so, so pleased, Mr. Jefferson, to be talking about gardens. You, you brought up peas, and I want you to know, sir, that I am on my third generation of my own saved pea seeds, and there's a real pleasure in that. And they're doing very well. I, I would suspect yours have come and almost gone by this time. Well, of course, Monticello um, is much more advanced in its uh, seasonality than the part of the world that you live in. I don't know, frankly, why any rational person would live up where you do. Uh, the cold is something that I... I'm a mere orangutan when it comes to heat and cold. I couldn't live in a subarctic place, and particularly with it, its very short growing season, as I'm told. Mr. Lewis said that the winters are essentially unspeakable, 
uh, in Dakota. But leaving that uh, aside, the, the, the climate in Monticello is, is, is almost the perfect human climate. We get more than 40 inches of rain per annum, uh, which is enough and more. And the soil is rich. Uh, my gardens uh, tend to flourish. Uh, and a, a very large variety of things can grow at Monticello, and, the, and, and, and they're not hampered in any way by a short growing season. In fact, we start to, to grow things like lettuce in February, um, and they sometimes don't flourish, but we every week I would take a thimble uh, full of lettuce seeds and think of how many uh, lettuce heads or leaves of lettuce you can get from a thimble full of lettuce seeds that they're that tiny and I would create a little trough and plant them and then that would be week one and the next week I would plant another thimble full and the week after that another and so they would flourish now lettuce tends not to do well in August or July when the weather gets very um, very severely hot but in a cooler part of the year uh, yes you can start growing lettuce at a time when I suppose up there in Dakota you're 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 covered in snowstorm. Well, I, I rather than get into an argument about climates, uh, I, I will say, sir, that living in a cold climate builds character and forces you to plan ahead. But leaving that aside, uh, you mentioned forty inches of rain, and I, I'd like to come back to that uh, because it is a, a source of concern for those of us who live in this area. But before we do, we talk about that, I, I do want to once again publicly thank you for years ago encouraging me to keep a garden book. And I have done that for a number of years now, and I am so grateful that you encouraged me to begin that process. Now, Sir, let me ask I you would... this question about that. Uh, you, I, I'm, I'm, of course, delighted to hear you say that because if I can persuade another human being to do the right thing in a matter of order, uh, that's a victory for the Enlightenment. Um, I know why I kept my garden books and how much they helped me, but to explain why your keeping records along the, the corridors of my advice has helped you in any material way. Well, you, as you talked about, it's a challenge to grow in, in the Dakotas because it's, it, it is a short growing season. And the more you garden, the more you begin to understand. As you said, lettuce doesn't do very well when it gets quite hot. Uh, tomatoes, if it gets too hot, the pollen dies and the flowers drop off and they bear no fruit. So uh, by keeping a garden book, I can track, you know, okay, last year I began my indoor plantings on March 19th and it seemed a little late or a little early. I can actually not guess about what the rainfall was. I can go back to my book and find out exactly what it was. And then, of course, as you know, sir, every year you garden, you learn something new. And those are the bold entries in my garden book. Remember next year to do this. So it, it, there are many, many advantages of that. And, of course, it's a very pleasurable thing to do. So you actually learn by accumulating this data. You know, this is what Francis Bacon teaches us. You know, Bacon, one of my three heroes, was one of the fathers of the English scientific revolution. He was also a, a tremendous essayist, and he wrote some books which sort of cleared the path of, of, of Western learning and eliminated scholastic thinking as a serious form of human thought. Uh, but his argument was uh, called induction, that if you um, planted 50 different types of seeds this year and 30 of them flourished, but 20 didn't, and then you planted the same number of seeds next year and 10 flourished, but 40 didn't, and so on, that over time you would start to discern the laws of nature. You would say, oh, in all these years I've never had good rutabagas. Oh, and all these years, no matter what else is true, I've had excellent tomatoes. Or tomatoes that are planted in May um, are more likely to survive the late frosts than tomatoes that are planted in April. And so Bacon said that if, you, if you're patient and you keep accumulating this data and then studying it um, so that you begin to compare notes from different parts of a garden, from different years, from different amounts of precipitation, different heat, etc., that you will eventually discern the laws 
of your garden up there in Dakota as I discerned the laws of my gardens at Monticello. And, and, I'm, and I might say next year, I'm not going to waste seed by planting my tomatoes in April because they may not survive. And so I'll, I will actually be a better and more efficient gardener if I wait till May 7th or maybe 8th. So that's the Baconian inductive method of human wisdom. And you're saying you actually do not only keep these records, but you consult them and you learn from them? I do, sir. I, I go back years to, to see what I've done differently and why this variety was so good that year and wasn't very good the next year. And and I actually, I date my seeds and I'll say, well, 2014, this variety was really good, but 2016, it wasn't. So I'll go back to the seeds from 2014. Isn't it true, sir, that my staff at Monticello has actually given you certain seeds from our gardens? That's very true, sir. There was a woman there that became a good friend. She sent me a dibble, if you, if you know what a dibble is. You would have to be on your hands and knees and in the dirt to know what a dibble is. Well, of course I know what a dibble is, sir, but she sent you one, she fashioned one for you, and then what sort of seeds did she send you? A variety of different things, sir. She she was such a great resource, you know, and if people can go to Monticello now and, and actually buy varieties of vegetables that you grew, sir. I'm not in favor necessarily of selling them. You know, I, I regarded Monticello as a sort of a scientific laboratory and I freely gave pairs of merino sheep to people who might wish to incorporate that superior species of or subspecies of sheep into their herds. And I exchanged seeds with, um, with greenhouse owners and other botanists all over the country, even all over the world. And I, th I think in, in terms of the, of the principles of the Enlightenment, that he who lights his torch from my candle illuminates himself without darkening me, I think similarly that if we share seeds and help each other to make things flourish, that all of humanity will benefit from that. But let me ask you another question. Uh, as I understand it from my friend Meriwether Lewis, my protege who lived with me in the White House for a couple of years before he made his famous tour, that these man, you have Mandan Indians up there, don't you? We do, sir. And uh, they were a great source of seeds. In fact, I think some made it back to you but before we talk about that, I, I should mention the name of the, the, the woman who was the head gardener at Monticello. She has since retired, but it was Pat Brodowski. And, sir, I think if you were to go back and see the work that she has done at Monticello, you would be most pleased. But, yes, the Mandans were a heavily agricultural community. They had fields. I believe that Lewis and Clark talked about seeing fields of the Mandan villages five miles out as they traveled towards the villages. Yes, as I understand it, the, these Mandans, and they, they fascinate me in a number of ways, but that they were farmers and that they would use the annual flooding, the, you know, the sort of the overflow that occurs in the Missouri, and it would, it would, it would refresh these mud flats alongside the river, and that then they would plant their crops there and they erected scaffolds, as I understand it, and then young Mandan women from special clans or societies that were dedicated to this would climb up as sort of human scarecrows and sing to the plants and watch over them uh, and take special um, regard for them. And, and is it also true, as, as I've been told, that the Mandan stored enormous quantities of, of sunflowers and sunflower seeds and squashes and beans and particularly corn in some sort of underground cairns or pits? This is true. All of what you say is accurate, according to my understanding. One thing you didn't mention were how beautiful these work songs that the Mandan women sang were. Would you care to hear just a, a short portion of one, sir? You, could, you can sing one? I could play a recording of a woman singing one, sir. I would be thrilled, you know, if Lewis and Clark, they didn't have your technologies. They, they didn't have any way of, of visualizing what they saw. They sketched a little, but they didn't have an artist. Uh, they, Lewis, at one point at the Great Falls of the Missouri, which he discovered on June 13th, 1805, said that he wished he had a, what was called a camera obscura, which was a sort of silhouetting camera lens. You, it would silhouette something and you'd have to draw 
what appeared on the back of that camera with a pencil, but he, he wished he had a, a, a camera obscura for that, and they didn't have any way of recording sounds. Uh, he recorded bird sounds, uh, and he was quite good at it, by the way. He had a great ear for birds, but he, and he also recorded the names of some of the native peoples he met. And so, for example, the most famous of them, uh, the one you call Sakagawea, he phonetically spelled her name sa ka gar wea or sa ka gar mia and said that it meant bird woman. But he phoneticized these names of people like Tetoharski and Posakapsehe and so on. But sa ka gar mia he did all of that, and so we have a little, but we would have given anything to have what you like to call a recording of sound, of the songs that he heard, the drumming, all of the things that one might hear in spending some time with the Mandan or the Nez Perce or the Clatsop. But you you say you have, how, how, sir, do you have access to a song that Mr. Lewis might have heard? I do this, I, I record music, I that would be a long discussion as to how I do it and the equipment and uh, necessary, the scientific advancements that have made it possible to do this. But yes, uh, I have a number of good friends that are Mandan and Hadatsa survivors. And this woman's name is Nellie Yupi, and this is an authentic woman's work song. I'll play it for you, sir, and then perhaps you can react. All right, thank you. I, can't, I cannot wait to hear this. Imagine if you can, Mr. Jefferson, standing along the Missouri River, hearing the birds sing and the water rush by. This is a Mandan woman's work song. Fascinating, utterly fascinating. Sir, do you have any idea what she's saying? She is just singing what you call vocables. So in other words, there are no words. And so what was the purpose of this song? I, Lewis said that these young women belonged to corn clans or plant clans and that they were partly scarecrow to chase off birds and other predators, but they... I mean, I don't know that this can be true. It doesn't sound like the Enlightenment to me, sir, but he said that they sang to help the corn grow. It's often said that they cared for their corn as they would care for a child. You, sir, if you were to stand on a scaffold all day and watch the corn, I'm certain you would develop a relationship with it as well. Well, I don't know. That's the question. We're talking about physical... Oh, sure. I, I think you would. I think you would. I, you know, the way you speak about gardening and the obvious love you have for the plants and the amazement in their growth, I think you would. And I think you would also get a bit bored standing there all day. Well, and... that's what I was about to say. When I would be out puttering in my garden, I would sing psalms. The psalms had been set. They were beautiful um, uh, versions of the psalms in my time, and I would hum them. People often heard me humming or singing these. Well, there you are, sir. It's, it's, it's the same, the same well, thing, but, don't but you Well, but maybe, think? maybe not. I didn't sing, corn may you grow, I wish you could grow corn, I really praise you for growing. That's very different, don't you think? Well, yes and no, sir. Let me ask you another question. Uh, I'm told by Mr. Lewis that the Mandan were so ingenious that they had developed a number of different and distinct varieties of corn, maize, and that some of them were for corn flour and some of them were for eating sweet corn and some of them were for 
taste and so on. Is this true that they were engineering varieties of corn? This is true, sir, and that we have a number of sites in this cold weather place, Dakota, that one can go and see earth lodges that the Mandan lived in. In other words, are reconstructed earth lodges. There are some National Park Service sites, in particular the Knife River Indian villages, where one can go and see examples of how they stored the corn, what kind of corn they grew, and and walk into an earth lodge as if you were here during the time of Lewis and Clark. I wish you could visit, sir. I would give anything, and I think you understand how sincere I am, I would give anything to hear those songs and to watch those maidens on those scaffolds and to see their underground pits or cairns or caches of such produce. Um, uh, Mr. Lewis spoke of the Mandan as uh, amongst the most admirable of the Indian peoples that he met. But I can tell you this, at Monticello, if I'd sent my daughters Martha and Maria out to sing to our garden, there would have been a petticoat rebellion, sir. <laughs> well, who knows? I I wish you had the opportunity to try. We, I, I guess we can both agree that that time spent close to the earth gardening is is something we would encourage everybody to do. Even if it's a pot on a patio growing a tomato, it's a great thing, and it will give you a pleasure you can get no other way. Now, speaking of the tomato, I don't think these Mandan had that. No, no, sir, I don't either. They did have squash, they had beans, and they had corn. What a pity that they did not know the joy of the tomato. I mean, I was an early American champion of the tomato at a time when there was some concern that as a nightshade that it might not be actually very good for humans. I certainly wouldn't eat the leaves, but I'm a huge believer in the tomato. And of course, I was in France and Italy enough to know how central the tomato had become to the cuisine, especially of Northern Italy, but also of France. And I, when I think of my life, I can imagine not having beef, I'm essentially a vegetarian, although I do eat meat. I, I can't really imagine not having corn or peas or beans or, for that matter, onions. And to life without the tomato would be an impoverished life for me, I think. How, how about you, sir? Oh, agreed. Sadly, sir, we need to take a short break from this conversation. I thank you so much. I just feel refreshed after talking to you about gardening today, sir. I loved that song, sir. And if you have more, uh, please allow me to hear it. Very good. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to this special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour on Gardening. And David Swenson, the semi-permanent guest host of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, virtually sitting across from me at the other end of the Missouri Flats in Bismarck, North Dakota. I have an announcement for you. Oh, yeah? I have in my hands that came this day a a package from one Pat Brodowski, the former gardener at Monticello, one of my dear friends, and in it are seeds. And let me just... Let me just tell you, these are she. She's done what Jefferson did. She's packed them in small envelopes of her own making and then taped them. Something I don't think the 3M company existed in Jefferson's time for the tape. And then she's labeled them. And this one says nickel, fillet, bush bean, tiny green, um, etc. Then there is crisp, refreshing, uh, purple king sessing pole bean. You should soak the seeds overnight. Dwarf French bean, purple queen, bush bean. I got this from Ireland, hoping it would be Jefferson-ish. Uh, it was grown, um, etc. Then gold vining pole beans, large flat pods, yellow color, multicolor willow leaf lima beans. And then these two, I'll share these with you. Then these two strange things, hyacinth bean. It says, lovely flowers, pods edible if cooked twice. Well, that ain't going to happen. But here I have this set of seeds from my dear friend, Pat Bradowski. And you know what? She could, if she had sent me a Jeep Grand Cherokee Limited, I would not be as happy as I am with this packet of seeds that she put together and sent to me. What a, what a marvelous thing. And what a coincidence that today, as we do this, 
that this uh, this package should have arrived. Thank you, my friend Pat. She is so great. We've talked with her in the past on the program a number of times and raved about what a marvelous job she did when she was there. And she did hand carve a couple of dibbles, sent one to you, sent one to me. Every year, I get it out, my treasured little dibble, and use it to plant seeds. And then I text her and thank her for it again. There's probably a lot of people who don't have an idea what a dibble is. Do you want to tell them? Uh, think of a think of a wooden top, like a wooden top that you had as a child, and now make it narrower, like the head of a of a of a pointy mushroom. That's about the size of it, and it's made of wood, and so it's carved. And then you take that dibble and you press it into the soil, to uh, and the depth of that dibble will tell you where to put the seed. Is that a fair uh, description? Yeah, of course you can use it to straighten rows and all sorts. It's just it's just an obvious. Uh, no frills, not fancy garden tool, but it's Pat Bradowski made it. So it's something. She went farther. She's done two other things for me. That I feel so fortunate. She she gave me a seed box where she crafted this box. It's vertical. It's probably six by six by 18 inches. And then she put little brass hooks in it. And each one has a glass vial with seeds that are carefully labeled for different plants and it's the kind of seed museum or seed catalog that Jefferson had at Monticello. It's one of the greatest gifts I've ever received. And then she saw me performing as Jefferson once, and she said, your shirt is no good. So she made me a linen shirt, and it took her uh, roughly seven years. But she did it, and it's so long. I have to, I'm have i supposed to hack it you know, to the right size, but it would make Wilt Chamberlain buried as if he were a baby. <laughs> It's that long, but it's a beautiful, beautiful shirt. And so, you know, she she can dye. She's you know she knows how to work with lavender, and she knows how to work with indigo, and she dyes this and weaves that, and she also spins. She she's like a master of the of the folk arts of the pre-industrial age, and has taught me so very much in the course of of my work on Jefferson, and and really became a friend to all Jefferson Hour listeners who visited the gardens at Monticello. Now, let me change the subject here. This is pretty serious stuff, David. Um, you and Jefferson got to talking about the ingenious Mandan, and you brought out this song we heard a piece of, um, and you said Nelly Yupi? Yes. And that you recorded this, and you and I have talked about this before, that the, the, the oral tradition is strong and tenacious, and that this song could be sung by someone today who doesn't particularly know a great deal about Mandan or Hidatsa history, but nevertheless has learned this from a grandmother or for an aunt or somebody, and that these songs hold up historically over time, and people have come out and recorded them, and the person that recorded this one, I believe, was, was a woman named Frances Densmore. Is that not true? Well, yes. Yeah, I mean, It's kind of a, a, a long story with a number of turns, but um, to shorten it, uh, what I played for Jefferson is a common woman's work song. Right. Um, and uh, But the, the interesting thing with Nellie was... Uh, there was another song that we recorded for uh, a, a, an album called People of the Willows, and she sang a song called The Corn Is My Pleasure. And in the case of that, I, I didn't know um, at the time that she recorded it that there was an existing scattered corn recording of the same song. And so I recorded Nellie singing this song, and we did it a couple of different ways and, in fact, orchestrated one um, with a, a brilliant composer by the name of Jovino Santos. Anyway, after the fact, I found the Scattered Corn recording, which was like 100 years old. And Nellie's version of it and Scattered Corn's version of it were like identical. And yet almost, Nellie didn't know of Scattered Corn. dead on pitch, dead on tempo, and... It, it had only been passed down through oral tradition. That makes this the 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 hair on my arm stand up. So I, I have a couple of things to say to this. First of all, Edward S. Curtis. I'm working on an exhibit now on the photographer and ethnographer Edward S. Curtis, who came 
to the Great Plains around 1909 or 1910. This was part of his 20-volume North American Indian project. He's the greatest Native American, the greatest photographer of Native Americans in our history, a stunning uh, photo artist using dry glass plates. And he came to North Dakota with the help of a, a Crow uh, man by the name of Alexander Upshaw, and he met a woman named Scattered Corn. So I'm guessing that might be her. Uh, probably her mother. But at any rate, you know, so this shows us a couple of things. Number one, the shortness of, of the history of the Great Plains, that you have a young woman named Nellie Yuppie who comes in, she sings this song. You then later realize, oh, this song echoes and more than echoes is faithful to a song that was first recorded on the Great Plains more than a hundred years ago. And you realize the tenacity and the fidelity of the oral tradition and that uh, people of our time who who uh, ha have been taught by their elders to sing these things may not fully understand the historic nature of them, but they get it, they intuit it, and they, they embody it. That's how important that oral tradition is. And the brevity of this, you know, let's just say that 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 the music you have of Scattered Corn, who was maybe, you know, 70, 80, 90 when this was recorded, imagine that she might have been a child in 1806 when Lewis and Clark came through. It's not impossible, and her mother certainly would have probably been alive at that time. So we're, it's, it's that, it's that proximus, it's that close. Yeah, and for me and the work that I do, which... I, somehow we need to turn this back to Jefferson, but he would be fascinated by all of this, I'm certain. Music has this ability to transport us in a way that I, I, no other art form really can. You know, you can argue with me about that, but that, that was one of the reasons I did that project about Lewis and Clark, Sounds of Discovery, is that I wanted to go where they were and record the sounds that they may have heard. I want to talk a little bit about my garden for a moment because I think Mr. Jefferson oh, please, would be please. interested. So, A, it's a drought here. You might even think twice in a year like this on the Great Plains of having a garden. B, I've been studying the pioneers, these uh, women who lived 150 years ago, the first homesteaders, and they would carry water in buckets uh, a quarter of a mile to water their potatoes and to water their tomatoes and to water their corn. They didn't have drip systems. They didn't have hoses. And those gardens often were a fair distance away from any source of water that they might have. And they would literally carry bucket after bucket after bucket out to nourish these plants. That's how important gardening was then. And the next thing I would say is that I've come to this breakthrough this year. I, I bought a new tiller from a fellow. I needed a new tiller. I couldn't afford to buy a new one. So I, I found one online here in Bismarck and I went to get it and he had a beautiful garden that he showed me. And it, he had laid down these, these lines of fabric between rows and stapled them to the ground. And he said, no weeds. And it's also a great conserver of water. So I went to my local hardware store and bought some of this fabric and it has really made a difference. And so I also have uh, gallon size coffee cans around each of the tomatoes. And so every two nights or three nights to go out and water each of the 58 tomato plants with a hose and that conserves the water. The tomatoes are doing just fine for the moment and now my corn has come up. I was worried about it but we got an inch of rain last week and it really made a difference and I'll tell you this when I go out there as I will tonight David and and, and, and get down on my hands and knees which is Actually, turns out to be not as easy as it once was. But when I get down <laughs> on my hands and knees and crawl through the garden and I see this little corn or I see a cucumber plant, you know, those two distinctive paddle-like leaves, I almost start to cry because I it's, it's the miracle of the mustard seed from the New Testament, you know, that Christ says that that salvation is like the mustard seed. The seed is almost invisible and it, and it creates this this huge plant, that that's the miracle of life. And when you when you go out in the garden and you see that, that that little seed that you put in eight days ago has sprouted and that's going to be a pea or that's going to be lettuce or that's going to be uh, a tomato or, or that's or that's going to be a carrot. Oh, it, it's, it's just, it's extraordinary. It's a mystical experience. And I think, hey, I grew that. I, I'm cooperating 
with the soil and I grew that. And then you have to, of course, you know, thin them out a little and make sure the weeds don't uh, uh, get in the way. You can't overwater them or underwater them. But it, it, I, I know you know exactly what I'm saying, but there is a feeling about it that is as close to um, a, a sense of the miraculous as you can get, except if you're in the room when your spouse has a child and you first see that, that infant. But there's just something magical about a garden. And it's a lot of work. There's no question about that. But I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to have a bumper crop of tomatoes. How about you? Well, I'm sitting here thinking, I, mean, I wonder if there's anybody still listening to the Jefferson Hour as we ramble on about gardens. Um, but Jefferson Jefferson would approve. He did approve, uh, as, as we talked earlier. And one thing I didn't talk to him about that you just brought up and he brought up, 40 inches of rain every year in Virginia and us in Dakota is like, oh, man, you know, it's, it's not just drought, it's exceptional drought. Um, and granted, we have had a couple of small reprieves, but Not those enough. of us who have lived through drought years, it's it's a horrifying experience. There's nothing you can do except that we have hoses and, and systems. I'm just thinking of these pioneers who had neither, and they and I don't depend upon my garden. If my garden died, uh, it wouldn't make a, a a bit of difference in terms of digestion or nutrition. But those people depended upon it, and one of the greatest things that ever happened in rural America was the creation of canning, of sealed cans that you could create a vacuum in. That's a post-Civil War technology that revolutionized the entire world of rural America. It, no, it's 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 something, I should say something too about our mutual friend, Russ. You know, we talked about um, the uh, Robinson Crusoe experiment. A number of years ago, I gave him a pea and said, your job is to, is to, is to, oh, fill, right. to yes. fill a warehouse with peas. And so he did. He started and he got a few peas. And then he had a couple of setback years. And I won't say there was human error, but I have my suspicions. But he had a couple of setback years. And now he, he claims that this year he has what might be called a bumper crop of peas. And I don't know if that's a bushel or a, um, a gallon jar, but he now is out of pea trouble. So in other words, if he saves back 20 peas in case of a bad next year, but plants the bulk of what he has, he will have a gigantic crop of peas next year, and he will no longer ever have to fear starvation. Whereas Robinson Crusoe knew that when he planted inadvertently those first seeds, if they didn't grow, he's done. There's no replacement seed. You have to save the seeds. Uh, Russ has done this, and um, and it's a it's a it's a good experiment. You've done it too. I have, and I've had great success with that. Uh, I should say two things at this point. We're almost out of time. Uh, we did this program because people ask us to do it, um, and so um, and I thought this was an exceptionally interesting Jefferson Hour with respect to gardens. Mr. Jefferson got onto one of his fascination moments there with the Mandan and their ingenious yeah. system, and boy, it's true. And I should say this too that my daughter, who was then. 11 or 12 years old, and I went up to the uh, Knife River Indian Villages, uh, which is a, a national historic site about 50 miles north of Bismarck, and she was allowed to participate in a Mandan Hidatsa garden seeding operation. Uh, men not allowed, only women, and she was um, invited by my friend Amy Mossett, your friend too, uh, to do this. And so there was there were elder uh, women of the Mandan Hidatsa world who were blessing that garden and blessing the seeds. And this was grown next to an earth lodge up there, a recreation of an earth lodge, but done under exactly the right uh, architectural designs. And, and this garden had been laid out. It had been hoed with a buffalo shoulder hoe in the old way. And then the seeds were blessed and the young women who were allowed to participate got to get down in the soil and plant those seeds. And it was, a, it was an extremely moving experience for me and an even more moving experience for my child to see, you know, the, my grandparents were farmers and there was something sacramental about farming for them. But with Native Americans, it's not something sacramental. It is sacramental. It's a sacred thing. Well, back to our discussion about, uh, and then we should say goodbye for the week, but our discussion about Jefferson wondering about living corn, and I'm questioning him about standing in a scaffold and 
There, there's a quote that I recall from Mahadi Wea. Uh, she had, a, she wrote a book called uh, "Buffalo Bird Woman: My Life on the Northern Plains, 1840 to 1890." She wrote, "Quote: We thought that the corn plants had souls, as children have souls. We cared for our corn in those days, as we care for a child." You know, David, I was a little disappointed when you. I, I thought you would love my corn song that I sang on the show, and you would want well, to record it. was great. It. it was great. Yeah, that's, I sang a corn song as Mr. Jefferson, trying to get into the spirit, and you just moved he's, right he's on. Got a, Jefferson's got a better voice than you do. I hope so. But I, Think you know, about that. I'm gonna, you know what I'm going to do tonight? I hope my neighbors don't turn me in. I'm going to go out and sing to my tomatoes. Well, you know, you could just hum psalms like Jefferson. Anyway, it's been a great, uh, been great fun, and I hope people enjoyed it, and we shall return. Thank you, Pat Bradowski. Thanks for being with us today. We'll see you next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program through the eyes of Thomas Jefferson.